Learn well, languages and the arts. Strike at your foe, be struck back in return. Befriend your foe, and secure your own peace. Seek out the wrong, that's only the first half. To set it right, that's the tougher half. Aloha. Today we're gathered to remember and honor a true son of Hawaii, Spark Masuyuki Matsunaga. In a time when we seem to be just a heartbeat away from nuclear war, it's important to remember this warrior who dedicated his life to the pursuit of peace. Now we've asked a friend of his to say a few words about the late senator. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Kenny Hiro Hiroshi. Hi. Uh, they won't ask me to say a few words about my friend, uh, Spock Matsunaga. You know, if Spocky was here right now, he'd be laughing his head off because he no longer like talking in public. I mean, he was the outgoing guy. He was the guy who, you see a family with kids, you he, go over there and, and tell them stories from Hawaii. He took the time to be kind, to give help and advice to whoever needed it. Even an old capital cop like me. As Spocky believed in equality and that every man and woman should be judged for who, uh, who they were, you know, not by the color of their skin or by the shape of their eyes. He thought it was his mission to go and uh, to re help the weak and relieve, you know, all this uh, sadness, yeah? Oh. He believed in himself and figured he could do anything he put his mind to. He even got people like me to go believe in ourselves too. Spocky was born in Kukui Ula on the island of Kauai, 1916. But uh, his family go moved to Hanapepe in the 1920s. <laughs> That's when I go meet him. <laughs> Pocket time, yeah? Growing up, our pockets always filled with marbles. Because you never know when a game was going to start. I mean, we had the peeries and the agates and the cat's eyes and the bambuchas, the big marbles. And we're constantly winning and losing these marbles to each other. And if we weren't playing marbles, we we're playing baseball. <laughs> Everybody had one nickname. I mean, there was uh, Meatball Nozaki and Baksa Matsuda and Lefty Ozaki and Masayuki. Oh, that was Spocky's name back then. He was way smarter than the rest of us all put together. He even skipped a couple of grades. So he was younger and smaller than the rest of us. And a really slow runner. Oh. One older kid, I remember, was watching Spocky run around the bases, and he said, Hey, you stay slow and Spocky the old nag, eh? Sparky or Spock Plug was the name of the slow poke horse in the Barney Google Snuffy Smith Cummy Strip. After that, we just wouldn't call him Spocky. Now, Spocky's parents and my parents, we worked for a sugarcane company for a dollar a day. That's right. A dollar a day. Now, we was poor. Oh, but Spocky had a more worse. One time, Spocky would tell me, never have any food in the house. His mother would, like, skip meals if it wasn't enough to go around. Spocky's father was a spiritual healer, really well respected in the town. He also tells Spocky that understanding the deeper meaning of life came from hardship. 
I think Sparky's understanding of life was pretty dang deep. <laughs> Sparky always used to tell me, success in life demands an early goal that you must set and strive to gain. That's one of Sparky's Sparks. That's right, Sparky's Sparks. That's one of his sayings that he went collect and put inside this uh, 1985 pocket calendar. When we was juniors, then Sparky go talk to our civics teacher, Mr. Clopton. He say, Is it the objective of American democracy to pay a Caucasian worker, a holy worker, three times what is paid an Asian worker, even though they're doing similar jobs and standing side by side? Mr. Clopton said, No, no, of course not. But to change the system in Hawaii means you gotta change the laws. To change the laws, you gotta become a legislature, a lawmaker. That means you gotta go run for public office and become a politician. Mr. Clopton figure, yes, Hawaii gonna come on state pretty soon. So, you, Sparky, you should go run, become a United States Senator. Oh, powerful words, but Sparky won't take them too hot. Sparky was the first in his whole family for graduate high school. He wanted to go study University of Hawaii. But tuition was $120 a year. And Olaf, that was big money back then. So Sparky worked some jobs, tried to earn money. Then, 1937, the Garden Island newspaper had won subscription contests, and Sparky won. He got $1,000. He gave $600 to his parents and then was on the next overnight packet to Honolulu to begin studying University of Hawaii. See, this 1937, Japan just invaded China. And so for his freshman English class, Sparky went right on an essay called, Let Us Teach Our People to Want Peace. Inside the essay, Sparky goes say, If we want peace, we must educate our people to want peace. We must replace attitudes favorable toward war with attitudes that are opposed to war. Teachers should let generals fall to the background and perhaps replace them with leaders of social change and bring them to the foreground. We must show our young people that there are other types of bravery than that which is shown on the battlefield. Kind of naive, a little bit idealistic, but hey, that was Sparky. Now, Sparky went to graduate from University of Hawaii, 1941. And he was also commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army Reserve. And he will volunteer for service. Me, I won't get drafted. That's how Sparky ended up being the executive officer of our company over in Molokai. Now, that first uh, Sunday in December, we were going deer hunting. And then we see this plane flying above us. Get the red ball, the rising sun of Japan on top the wings. Sparky will say, hey, this maneuver is looking real realistic, you know. Then the radio starts squawking, saying, hey, we're being attacked by the Japanese. Oh, we all go outside, we all to look toward the wall. We see the smoke rising up from Pearl Harbor, 60 miles away. Then things will get a little bit crazy. I remember in the supply room, Sparky's there grabbing guns, handing out guns, and telling us where to take up positions on the beach, because we're defending this uh, airfield there. I mean, we were scared. We thought the Japanese was going to invade. Then this Japanese submarine surfaced and start shooting at the uh, field depot over in the airport. Oh, we return fire. Drive the submarine away. <sighs> in May 1942, all of us Japanese American soldiers, we all get gathered up and we get shipped to Camp McCoy in Wisconsin. Oh, they go reorganize us into the 100th Battalion separate. We can call ourselves the one Puka Puka. Puka is zero or ho in pigeon, yeah? After a little bit of basic training, they go ship us over to Italy to go fight the Germans. 
this place called uh, Hill 600, about 80 miles southeast of Rome, near this town called Monte Cassino. By this time, Sparky get, he get uh, promoted, you know, first lieutenant, executive officer of Company D. We're going up this hill, and one guy go set off this mine, slightly wounding Sparky in the neck, but badly wounding his radio operator, Kazuo Kawano. Oh, we're waiting for the medics to come up. And Kazuo tells Sparky, you know you're going to mock it. You know you're going to die. But he kind of wished that, uh, you know, his death maybe make things a little bit more easy for his friends and family back home. After about an hour, Kazuo died. Sparky wouldn't go right. It was not meant for man to kill a man. It was meant for man to love a man. But who am I but mortal's tool? No better than a monarch's fool? To play a part on earth assigned. No choice, no will. Afraid, resigned. That was from a poem he went right called Mortal's Tool in Italy, November 16, 1943. We're waiting to get evac out. Another person trip, another mine. This time badly wounding Sparky in the right leg, but blinding another soldier. When the medics came up, Sparky ordered them to take the blind guy out, even though he was officer. You know, he's supposed to be evac out first. Well, sun went down before the medics could come back. So Sparky spent a lonely night all by himself on Hill 600, nothing but his thoughts and the dead to keep him company. He was evac out the next day. See, Sparky wrote poetry when he was a kid. He wrote plenty more when he was in the hospital in Italy recovering. He told me that poetry saved him. Not so much the words, but the feelings the words brought up. See, his heart was numb. He said poetry made it come alive again. By capturing the hopelessness and madness of war, it brought up feelings of sanity and hope inside him, made him feel more human. Sparky went right once. You will get well, you must get well. Her words, the pain of wounds dispel, and courage give to spirits crushed, awaken designs for living hushed. That was from uh, Warner's Lieutenant Roning, 15th Evac Hospital, November 20th, 1943. So doing a brief visit with Sparky in the hospital, he wouldn't tell me that he didn't feel like he'd done his full share for the boys in the front. He said he wished he could go back. I look at him and say, hey, more better be one living lieutenant than one dead captain, yeah? yeah. Sparky got shipped back to the States in August 1944. In spring 1945, he was promoted to be captain. Then he was discharged two days after Christmas. He is awarded two Purple Hearts and the Bronze Star for exemplary conduct in combat during the Rome Arno campaign. January 30th, 1946, Sparky go change his name to Spark Masayuki Matsunaga. <laughs> Sparky won't go tell me <laughs> that uh, with a name like Masayuki, he figure you're not gonna even be elected dog catcher. <laughs> but me. <sighs> I stayed with the 100th. 100th became part of the 442, the all Japanese American unit. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team was the most highly decorated unit in US military history. Well, after the war, I got shipped back to Hawaii. And I go back to university again. But hey, that's when I go meet my wife. <laughs> ah, she let go law school, East Coast. Pack everything all up, 
move back mainland again. Uh, she going to school and I working, keep us going. Then she get job offer, you know, Washington DC. So we pack everything all up again. Move to Washington DC. This time I get job as uh, with the United States Capitol Police. I mean, we try to keep in contact with Spocky, but you know, it's kind of hard. I mean, I was years before I saw Spocky again. You know, my wife and I decided to start our family in between diapers and job. Oh, it was hard for keeping contact, yeah? I heard that he uh, got elected to the Territorial House of Representatives, even became majority leader. But uh, then Hawaii became state, 1959. Oh, that was a great day. On a cold January day, 1963, who should I see in this house chamber? Oh, my old friend Spocky. He got elected to the United States House of Representatives. His was the only Asian face in the whole sea of mostly white, mostly male faces. That's when we started our late night talks. See, I work night shift, and if I get break, then I go to his office. He's not busy. We sit, we drink tea, we talk. Spocky also could tell me, learn well the languages and the arts, for a genius unable to express himself is no better than a silent fool. See, in Congress, Spocky is looked upon as this idealist or dreamer, partially because of his love of poetry. He really felt strongly that Congress should create the position of United States Poet Laureate. He always argued that to recognize a talented poet would demonstrate further proof of our enlightened support of the arts. Spocky would submit a bill to create the position of United States Poet Laureate every year since 1963. For over 20 years, he would submit a bill every year. Finally, 1985, the bill was passed. <laughs> Persistent bugger, yeah? <laughs> that was Spocky, you know. <sighs> See, Spocky never wanted to confront an issue head on. He always did what the Japanese call nimawashi. Translating, eh, tending the garden, or through preparation. He would go behind the scenes and go talk to all of his colleagues and tell them what he wanted and ask for their support. And when he was ready, he unveiled his proposal with the support already lined up. His pocket, he was a big supporter of gun control. See, 1968, he say, more Americans have been killed with privately owned firearms since 1900, about 800,000 people that have been killed in all the wars America would go fight since 1776, about 630,000. Now one day Spock was telling me he was listening to this debate in the house and he looking up at the ceiling. On the ceiling of the house chamber is the great seal of the United States. And he's looking up and he say, hey, only get 48 stars. Supposed to be 50. He goes see the Speaker of the House and ask him to add two more stars. He asked that Hawaii's star be added to the head of the eagle and not the tail. And after that, he always go tell his, his colleagues from Alaska that, see that star by the head of the eagle? That's Hawaii's star. The other one, that's yours. Like other congressmen, Spocky would receive like 100 letters a day. And beginning, he responded to each one personally. You know, he would go out and like uh, work all day, and then in the evenings go to political function or diplomatic function, and they go back to his office, sip tea, answer letters, till like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. He wouldn't go home until his inbox was empty. After he went to get elected to the Senate, the Washington Post said 
called him the senator who never sleeps. It was kind of hard on his kids. But Sunday night dinner, oh, that was the din meal that made Sparky made sure he came home. He sit there, he'd say grace, and then uh, everybody sit down and eat. And then, toward the end of the meal, he go give quizzes to his kids or ask them riddles. So he go recite poetry that he'd go memorize or quote Shakespeare. <laughs> Sometimes he could try out his new jokes on his family. For example, the psychiatrist comes in and he's examining a new patient. And he asks him, who's more satisfied? A man with a million dollars or a man with six children? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> it's the man with uh, six children. Why is that? Because <laughs> a man with a million dollars always wants more. Never say it was good jokes. Sparky also continued writing poetry. In 1970, he won a $10 prize from the International Poetry Institute for his poem called Deja Vu. I've been here before, I say. That house, that wall, that brook, I've seen them all before, and yet I have never been this way, nor read in any book of what I've seen, I'm sure. What strange things our minds must know. We know not yet our minds. When Japanese Prime Minister Yasushiro Nakasone was visiting Washington, he made a comment on the beautiful cherry trees that were blooming. And Spaki recited a haiku poem that he had written. Cherry blossoms bloom. Washington is beautiful. East and West do meet. Nakasone was so impressed, he asked for a copy of Spaki's haiku. In 1976, Spaki was elected to the United States Senate. Oh, he was over the moon. This is something he had his heart set on from a long time ago, all the way back to when he was at junior high school in, when Mr. Clapton, our civics teacher, went go put the bug inside his ear. When Ronald Reagan was elected president, Sparky reluctantly voted to confirm Alexander Haig as Secretary of State. He always felt that Alexander Haig was a little too quick to come up with simple military solutions to kind of complicated for matters of foreign policy. So he gave Alexander Haig a little bit of advice, quoting President Taft, saying, War is not the continuation of foreign policy by other means. War is the failure of foreign policy. A yeah. little while later, Spocky and his wife was il invited to this big White House reception for visiting Japanese Prime Minister Zenko Suzuki. Uh, just before dinner, uh, Spocky and his wife get ushered into this room with all the rest of the Japanese delegation. Only other American in the room? Secretary of State Alexander Haig. Alexander Haig go, go meet the Japanese Prime Minister and go shake hands with his staff and all his aides. And then they come to Spocky and say, Welcome to Washington, D.C. Do you speak English? At which Spocky will say, Why, yes, Mr. Secretary, I do. In fact, I had the honor of voting for your confirmation the other day. Spocky wrote another haiku. Hibiscus blooms. Hawaii's native flower extends aloha. You see, in Spocky's mind, keeping contact with the people back home, oh, that was the most important thing, because he couldn't fly home every single weekend. But over 30 people, on average, came visit him in Washington, D.C. So he always made sure he'd give him a tour of the Capitol, take him out to lunch first in the, in the House dining room and then later on in the Senate dining room. <laughs> he brought so much business to the Senate dining room that they eventually gave him a discount on their famous bean soup. <laughs> All this started way back, 
1964, when this elderly couple from Maui came and visited Washington, D.C. A neighbor gave Sparky a call and said, hey, can you got a few minutes to spend with these people? This is the first time these people ever been away from Hawaii. So Sparky take them around, give them a tour of the capital, take them out to lunch. And now they're taking pictures, shaking hands. And the old man say, eh, Sparky, I won't go work for Maui Pineapples for 40 years. I'll go pay Uncle Sam taxis. I will get back nothing in return. I know grumble. But after today, Uncle Sam will go pay me all back. Spock used to say, strike at your foe and be struck back in return. Befriend your foe and secure your own peace. Even though Spocky was a soldier and a warrior, he was relentless in his pursuit of peace. Now, the idea of an office for peace in the federal government, oh, that dates way back to George Washington's time. But Spocky had a vision of a center that would do research in conflict resolution. Uh, and it would, like, give training and education and techniques of Resolving conflicts without resort to violence. You know, also say, the Academy of Peace will not eliminate our need for a strong national defense. But by learning to cope with international conflicts without resort to violence, we'll increase our national security and reduce our reliance upon costly weapons. It will be a positive action toward ensuring world peace in the future by teaching future international leaders the art of peacemaking, the art of resolving conflicts without resort to violence. Spocky will submit a bill to create the Peace Academy for every year so he was in Congress since 1963. For 20 years, every year he submitted a bill. But in 1983, he submitted the bill with 52 senators as co-sponsors. That means the senators say, I agree with this bill. I'm going to vote for him. In 1984, the United States Peace Institute was created. 21 years after he first submitted the bill and 47 years after he wrote that essay for his freshman English class about letting our people to want peace. I have had the unforgettable experience of watching many of my men die at the front. Men with whom I had played while a kid, with whom I had gone to school, and men whom I had learned to love and respect. Memories of their comradeship will forever haunt me. Not because they were buddies of mine, but because so many of them, in their last few words on earth, even as they lay mortally wounded on the ground, told me, in effect, well, Lieutenant, I hope that as a result of my dying, you... You and my wife, my kids, and all those remaining at home will have a better life in a better world. 1982, Sparky goes running for re-election for the Senate. He'd jump on an airplane Thursday afternoon, fly all night, come to Hawaii, campaign on Friday, campaign on Saturday, jump on an airplane, fly back to D.C. on Sunday. Sparky once told, this rally, political rally, yeah? I went to bed shortly after midnight. I was wide awake at 2.30 in the morning. You cannot imagine how frustrating it is to be a politician in an election year, to be wide awake and have no one's hand to shake. Spocky believed that uh, a representative or a senator only had two main duties. One, to look after the interests of your constituents in your state and look after the interests of your state in Washington, D.C. 
two. To work with your colleagues from other states and with members of the opposing political parties to promote the national interest and to resolve conflicts at the national level. I've been assigned to four different subcommittees. Um, the Where are they? The uh, principal one of which is the uh, Foreign Agricultural Operations uh, Subcommittee, headed by uh, Congressman Polk of uh, Texas. And this is the committee uh, which uh, has been looking into uh, the uh, European common market and its effect upon uh, agricultural product shipments from the United States uh, to Europe. We have had uh, several hearings uh, within the subcommittee, and uh, I found it uh, very interesting to learn uh, that uh, uh, pineapple, for example, uh, plays uh, a very important part in this uh, uh, common market setup, uh, in that uh, France has uh, refused uh, up-to-date uh, to let canned fruits in. And uh, since France is now a member of, of the common market, uh, and the common market uh, likely will permit uh, canned fruits into uh, its jurisdiction, well, we face the uh, objection of uh, France as the sole nation within uh, the membership who still refuses to admit uh, canned fruit. Bucky was a big proponent of uh, alternative energy including uh, geothermal steam and solar power. His whole idea was to just reduce the costs of energy so that Americans could have all the energy that they need. He would often say, unless we become an energy independent nation, we will never be able to fully and completely determine our own destiny. This imperative requires that we exploit all renewable energy resources. See, ten years before the Gulf War, Spocky Wingo predicted a major conflict would happen in the Persian Gulf. Americans have already died protecting the oil supply at a time when oil is relatively plentiful. Without alternatives to oil, imagine the international danger when the oil supply begins to become scarce. Most of Spocky's words fell on deaf ears. He was just a little bit ahead of his time. Spocky would always say sometimes, To seek out the wrong, that's only the first half. To set it right, that's the tougher half. For me, Spocky, biggest thing was to go and get redress, obtaining redress or an apology for the Japanese Americans who went go and get put in these prison camps across the United States during World War II. For Dean, this could push all of Spocky's buttons. Yeah? He could say, it went against, he touched upon his uh, item of fair play, his, his sense of equality, his vision for the nation, and for his uh, whole dislike for any kind of discrimination. See, after Japan went bomb Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which, under which 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of whom were Americans, were put inside these concentration camps across the United States in isolated parts. Some people were held for the whole duration of the war. 1982, National Commission basically said, that Executive Order 9066 was unwarranted, and the decision was shaped by racial prejudice, war hysteria, and the failure of political leadership. Now, the commission had these recommendations, and Spocky's bill, his legislation, followed the recommendations, in basically which the United States government would apologize 
to the Japanese Americans and pay each survivor $20,000. For Sparky, redress was went right to the heart of American democracy. What happened to the Japanese Americans could happen to any Americans. For him, he always said, redress is about setting the political, historic, and moral record straight, and to clear the conscience of the nation. Spocky will line up 76 senators as co-sponsors of the bill, veto-proof majority. Again, co-sponsors of the bill. Normally a bill you get like one, maybe six senators as co-sponsors. He had 76. So in 1988, Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act into law. Spocky was a workaholic, yeah? But I uh, kind of wish that he had taken more time to take care of himself and to sit back and to really kind of like, you know, admire all the stuff he would accomplish. In 1984, Spocky had a mild heart attack. Spent like 10 days in the hospital, and about two weeks at home. I mean, it kind of was kind of serious, but he always kept his sense of humor. I remember, he joked about getting old. First thing that you forget are names, and then faces. And then, after trips to the urinal, you forget to zip up your trousers. A little later on, during visits to the urinal, you forget to unzip your trousers. And no laugh. We are getting there. 1988, Spocky realized something was wrong. He went to the hospital in great pain. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer. In two years, cancer spread to his bones. He was confined to a wheelchair. He was so weak, could barely speak, and he would be wielded into the Senate to cast his votes. April 3rd, 1990, he was wheeled into the Senate to cast his vote for the extension of the Clean Air Act. He was so weak he couldn't speak and had to indicate his vote with a thumbs up. The last vote Spocky ever cast in the U.S. Senate. On April 15th, 1990, Easter Sunday, my friend, Spock Masayuki Matsunaga, passed away. Spock, you won't go tell me once. It's better to be considered a good man than a great one. For greatness is an assessment of mortals, but goodness is a gift from God. Spocky lay in state under the capital rotunda, and then was flown home to Hawaii for the last time. He lay in state in the state capital, and was buried in Punchbowl, National Cemetery of the Pacific, beneath a simple marble marker. It reads, Spock, Masayuki Matsunaka, United States Senator, October 8, 1916 to April 15, 1990, beloved son of Hawaii. My friend Spocky went for me. I want to be remembered as a friend of the peacemakers. I want to be remembered as a friend of the veterans, for without them, we would never be able to enjoy the fruits of democracy. It has been my experience that the best public servants are those who continue to dream, who refuse to become cynical, and who have the courage to translate their dreams into reality. It's been said that uh, war and peace are the ends of the same rainbow. Sparky experienced the bitterness of war and was always searching for a sweet and everlasting peace. He pointed the way. 
it's up to us to find the end of that rainbow, to find our own sweet and everlasting peace. Aloha everybody, e komomai kako, and welcome to the Spark M. Matsunaga International Children's Garden for Peace. Sparky Matsunaga was someone that we very much appreciated being able to select to honor. His family was also appreciative of us selecting his legacy and his story. Spark was a champion for peace. He was a champion for the arts. He loved humanity and he knew that humanity could thrive and survive if we would only create a peaceful world. His story is an important one, especially for young people to learn who grow up here. This garden was carefully designed to reflect diversity and interaction. These are two values that Sparky Matsunaga held very closely to himself. Diversity in the sense that people all over the world are humanity and that's so important and interaction because how do we solve our problems? We interact and we communicate with each other. Put a lot of thinking and a lot of care into the design of the garden and we hope that you enjoy it when you come to visit here. We welcome school groups, we welcome events uh, like an anniversary or parties and uh, especially we enjoy sharing our aloha uh, culture, our Hawaiian culture with visitors who come visit us on Friday night. And if you'd like to leave a legacy here at Storybook Theater and continue the work of Spark Matsunaga, purchase a pathway brick and that will help us to continue. So ahui ho, aloha, malama pono.